how real are the gods? Is it giving too much away to say how real the gods are in the world of Westeros? Well, I don't, how real are the gods in our world? Um, a lot of people believe they're real. A lot of people have very intense faith in them, and uh, there are people who will swear that uh, you know prayer works, and certain prophets, uh, be it Jesus or Muhammad or uh, whoever, could work miracles and raise the dead and walk on water and you know what have you. Um, are are those things real or are those things myths? Um, we don't know, and I I. I Although my work is fantasy and it's set in an imaginary world, I want to ground it in realism. I, I look at the real world and I look at real history and I, I draw from that uh, for my parallels to hopefully give it the same sort of uh, verisimilitude there. I certainly don't intend ever to bring a god on stage in any of the Ice ah. and Fire books where a god will certainly suddenly appear. Like a genie uh, or something, yeah. Yeah, uh, there's fantasy that does that, but um, it, it, not mine. So we can say with fair certainty that Cthulhu will not have a cameo in Winds when Euron does the blood sacrifice. Welcome or welcome back to the Company of the Cat. Hi. In today's video, we are tackling religion in a soy of. <laughs> In the novels, religion plays a significant role in shaping the beliefs and actions of characters and more. From the old gods worshipped by the children of the forest and the Northmen to the faith of the seven, followed by most of the people in Westeros, to the Lord of Light, we see a diverse range of gods and faiths. Being in a magical universe, the gods in these series are portrayed as having real influence and power in the world, but the answer to their true existence and nature remains ambiguous allowing for interpretation, something that was done on purpose by Martin, from what I understand by the interview above. And indeed, the existence of gods is one of the most common topics of conversation in the Song of Ice and Fire fandom. <laughs> are they real? Which gods actually exist? Why are the seven so useless? It is obvious that Martin has spent a copious amount of time crafting the religions in the novels, and has also taken inspiration from real-life religions, with Christianity, Zoroaster, and various polytheistic Indo-European ones, as well as primordial nature-related faiths being some of them. He has also talked in fan meetings and interviews about the importance of mystery and ambiguity in fantasy, so I really don't think we will ever get an answer about the existence of deities. We can analyze and talk about it all we want, but this specific part of the story will always remain blank, and whatever speculation and theories we have will remain headcanons. And I'm okay with that, to be honest. We get a lot of information about magic in the universe, how it works, how it can be harnessed, and how religions are connected to it, but deities will never have an appearance, and the truth of their existence is a question that will remain unanswered. That doesn't mean we do not get clues about things that can help us understand some stuff, as well as have fun, while trying to understand stuff that is purposely vague and exists for thought-provoking purposes and not trying to prove why Euron is actually Benjamin Stark. <laughs> First of all, if deities are real, which of them actually exist? Are all the gods in A Song of Ice and Fire real, or are some of them merely constructs of the characters' beliefs? I recently uploaded a, an Instagram poll to see people's views on the topic. The majority of respondents chose the option, some of them are, and some of them are not. However, from my perspective, it seems that within the universe of a Soyaf, the existence of gods is an all-or-nothing scenario, in other words, either all the deities across the various religions are real, or none of them are. There's little room for the possibility of some gods being real while others are not. Because looking at the religions and their core beliefs, they have many common traits and practices. Throughout the publications, we have seen a lot of religions, with the main ones being the old gods of, of the singers and the first men, the faith of the seven, the lord of light, the drowned god, and the many-faced god. We have various others mentioned here and there, but these are the religions we know about the most. And even though they look quite different from each other, they do have similarities. The old gods are nameless deities of stream, forest, and stone. They are nature gods, present in everything, living or not. Bum died, though. He died when he was two and I was six. Three days before his name day. Your little one is with the gods now. The woods which told his mother as she wept. He'll never hurt again, never hunger, never cry. 
The gods have taken him down into the earth, into the trees. The gods are all around us, in the rocks and streams, in the birds and beasts. Your bump has gone to join them. He'll be the world and all that's in it. The old gods are everything that surrounds them, nature and the world. The singers, according to Jojen, believe the weirwoods are the gods. A reader lives a thousand lives before he dies, said Jojen. The man who never reads lives only once. The singers of the forest had no books, no ink, no parchment, no written language. Instead, they had the trees and the weirwoods above all. When they die, they went into the wood, into leaf and limb and root. And the trees remembered. And their songs and spells, their histories and prayers, everything they knew about this world. Maesters will tell you that the weirwoods are sacred to the old gods. The singers believe they are the old gods. When singers die, they become part of the godhood. Leaf and blood raven, on the other hand, talk as if the trees are manifestations of the gods, a way of connecting with the gods, a gateway, but not exactly the gods themselves, because the gods are everywhere around them. Where are the rest of you? Bran asked Leaf once. Gone down into the earth, she answered, into the stones, into the trees. A man must know how to look before he hoped to see, said Lord Brynden. Those were shadows of days past that you saw, Bran. You were looking through the eyes of the heart in your god's wood. Time is different for a tree than a man. Sun and soil and water, these are the things a weirwood understands. No days and years and centuries. For men, time is a river. We are trapped in its flow, hurtling from past to present, always in the same direction. The lives of trees are different. They root and grow and die in one place, and that river does not move them. The oak is the acorn, and the acorn is the oak, and the weirwood, a thousand human years, are a moment to a weirwood. And through such gates, you and I may gaze into the past. Once you have mastered your gifts, you may look where you will and see what the trees have seen, be it yesterday or last year or a thousand ages past. Men live their lives trapped in the eternal present, between the mist of memory and the sea of shadow that we will know of the days to come. Certain moths live their whole lives in a day, yet to them that little span of time must seem as long as years and decades do to us. An oak may live 300 years, a redwood tree 3,000, a weirwood will live forever if left undisturbed. To them, seasons pass in the flutter of a moth's wing, and past, present, and future are one. Nor will you sigh be limited to your god's wood. The singers carved eyes into their heart trees to awaken them. And those are the first eyes a new green seal learns to use. But in time, you will see well beyond the trees themselves. The old gods are the gods of nature, of life and death. Even the way of communicating with humans is through nature, through winds and animals and trees. On the other hand, we have the Faith of the Seven, a religion based on the medieval Catholic Church, according to the author, although he said that it does borrow elements from various other religions as well. I have already talked about the Faith in two other videos. The central doctrine of one God with seven aspects is partly based on the Christian Trinity, one God in the divine person of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In the faith of the seven, God has seven aspects. Three males, the father, the smith, and the warrior. Three females, the mother, the maid, and the crone. And finally, the stranger, a genderless, dark figure who represents death. All of them archetypes we find in polytheistic, Indo-European religions, with some elements borrowed from the classical elements theory, such as the main symbol of the religion, the seven-pointed star. The faith is very similar to Christianity, especially Catholicism, based on the structure of the clergy, the way the faith was spread, and the societal and political role and power its church has. And of course the faith militant. The faith's military order is loosely based on crusading orders. The high septon has a very similar role to the pope. And we saw that after the Targaryens established the title of the king of the seven kingdoms, the power of the high septon slowly diminished, which also parallels real life, Catholicism. In addition to all this, the faith is again a religion connected to nature and the universe. Stars and light are elements important to the faith and are part of the universe and nature. The green seeds and the children could change their skins and speak through ravens, which, unlike humans, can speak the true tongue, the language of the singers. But in the faith of the seven, the first raven is said to have been led into the world when the crone peered through the door of death. The crone represents wisdom, and followers of the faith pray to her for guidance. Her statues often show her with a lamp in one hand, and according to the seven-pointed star, she guides the faithful through visions and dreams, connecting an aspect to the seven to some of the practices and beliefs of the worshippers of the old gods. Pentos before becoming a Valyrian colony, 
was part of the kingdom of Andalus. The sandal blood is still present in the area. In earlier days, the city was ruled by a prince of high and noble birth, chosen from among the adult males of the so-called forty families. Once chosen, the prince of Pentos ruled for life. When one prince died, another would be chosen, almost always from a different family. Over the centuries, however, the power of the prince steadily eroded, whilst that of the city magisters who chose him grew. Today, it is the council of magisters that rules Pentos. For all practical purposes, the prince's power is largely nominal. His duty is almost entirely ceremonial. In the main, he presides over feasts and balls carried from place to place in a rich palanquin with a handsome guard. Each new year, the prince must deflower two maidens, the maid of the sea and the maid of the fields. This ancient ritual, perhaps arising from the mysterious origins of pre-Valyrian Pentos, is meant to ensure the continued prosperity of Pentos on land and at sea. Yet if there is a famine, or if a war is lost, the prince becomes not a ruler, but a sacrifice. His road is slit so that the gods might be appeased, and then a new prince is chosen who might bring more fortune to the city. If indeed this ritual is a remnant of the first Andal inhabitants, we see the religion and customs being again connected to nature and the world around them, even though at first glance the faith doesn't look like a nature-based religion. The drowned god is again a nature-based deity, connected not only to the sea, but to fire as well. He is seen as the creator of the seas and father of the Ironborn, who believe they themselves came from his watery halls, and is said to have made the Ironborn in his own likeness, to rave, rape, cart out kingdoms, make their names known in fire and blood and song, and to hold dominion all over the waters of the earth. The Ironborn believe that the drowned god is opposed by the storm god. This Malian deity dwells in the sky and has a hatred for men and all their works, the storm god resides in a cloudy hall and sends cruel winds, lashing rain and thunder and lightning down upon men. These two said to have been at war against one another for a thousand thousand years. In Riveran, they would tell you different. They say the Red Comet is a herald of new age, a messenger from the gods. A sign it is, the priest agreed, but from our god, not theirs. A burning brand it is, such our people carried of old. It is the flame the drowned god brought from the sea and it proclaims a rising tide. It is time to hoist our sails and go forth in the world with fire and sword as he did. According to their stories, it seems that the storm god is just the same power the singers and the first men believe to be the old god since we see them associate trees and ravens with him, which they resent. He returns a foot. Send your women away, my lord, and the maesters as well. He had no love for maesters. The ravens were creatures of the storm god, and he did not trust their healing, not since Urim. The moon was a crescent, thin and sharp as a blade of a knife. A pale sun rose and set and rose again, red leaves whispered in the wind. Dark clouds filled the skies and turned to storms. Lightning flashed and thunder rumbled, and dead men with black hands and bright blue eyes shuffled round a cleft in the hillside, but could not enter. Under the hill, the broken boy sat upon a weirwood throne, listening to whispers in the dark as ravens walked up and down his arm. They too was aptly named. The trees were huge and dark, somehow threatening. Their limbs woven through one another and creaked with every breath of wind, and their higher branches scratched at the face of the moon. The sooner we are sat of here, the better I will like it, as I thought. The trees hate us all, deep into their wooden hearts. The other dualistic religion we see is that of Rolor, the god of light, heat, and life, with Rolor's antithesis being the great other, the god of ice and death. Similarly to the Ironborn, the followers of Rolor believe that there are only two gods, the lord of light, and the Great Other, who waged an eternal war over the fate of the world. Like in most religions, we see the followers associate the Red Comet with their god, as well as the stars and the sun that light up the sky and guard them. One very interesting practice is that of the last kiss. When a follower of the Lord of Light dies, the priests fill their mouths with fire and breathe flame into the deceased, as they believe that fire cleanses and is a bright gift. And um, it sometimes brings people. <laughs> back from the dead, apparently, as we saw with Beric Dondarion. Harvin and Thoros of the Brotherhood refer to it as the kiss of life, a term used by the followers of the drowned god as well, who also practice a resuscitation ritual. The religion of the Lord of Light is similarly a religion based on a natural classical element, fire, and the Red Priest preach that life is warmth and warmth is fire and fire is gods and gods alone. There are several competing religions in the series now, should we wondering if some are more true than others? In a world with magic, is religion just magic with an extra layer of mythos? Well, the readers are certainly free to wonder about the validity of these religions, the truth of these religions, and the teachings of these religions. I am a little leery on the word true, 
whether any of these religions are more true than others. I mean, look at the analog of our real world. We have many religions too. Are some of them more true than others? I don't think any gods are likely to be shown up in Westeros any more than they already do. We're not going to have one appearing, Deus Ex Machina, to affect the outcomes of things, no matter how hard people pray. So the relation between the religions and the various magics that some people have here is something that the reader can try to puzzle out. To me, it looks like the many different kinds of magic and religions in the ice and fire world may be manifestations of the same mysterious supernatural force, forces, And this is what the followers of the many-faced god believe too, in a quite a nihilistic way. Our forebears came from half a hundred lands to this place of refuge to escape the dragon lords who had enslaved them. Half a hundred gods came with them, but there is one god all of them is certain common, him of many faces and many names. In Kohor he is the black god, in Gidi the lion of night, in Westeros the stranger. All men must bow to him in the end, no matter if they worship the seven or the lord of light, the moon mother, or the drowned god, or the great shepherd. All mankind belongs to him. And somewhere in the world would be folk who lived forever. Do you know of any folk who live forever? No. All men must die. The founders of the Faceless Men came to believe that all of the very diverse slave population of Valyria prayed for deliverance to the same god, the god of death, who took various forms depending on the religion. Which does make sense. No matter how different one religion is from the next one, all of them have an afterlife. Death is inevitable, and the uncertainty of what comes after someone dies was always something people were curious and fearful about. Maybe all these people couldn't find common ground in all other aspects, but death was something that offered that, as sad as it sounds. Followers of him of many faces consider death to be part of the natural order of things and a merciful end to suffering. Religions in general develop differently based on the unique combination of geographical, cultural, historical and individual factors present in each society. These factors interact with and influence one another, leading to a diverse array of religious beliefs and practices. The Ironborn are a seafaring folk. Of course, they don't like storms. They, along with the Andals, had one of the most sexist cultures, something that is reflected both on their social customs and religion, more than in others. The slaves were praying for death and were interacting with other people with different beliefs who had different customs, but in the end had the same fate and wish as them. So why would one god be more real than the other when apparently everyone had the same end? Even if we compare all the religions, the similarities are everywhere. In the Summer Isles, they worship a score of gods whose many laws are written upon the talking trees. The god and goddess of love, beauty and fertility is the most favored, and enough they have the Lord of Harmony, regarded as the only true God, the one who always was and always would be that made the moon and stars and earth, and all the creatures that dwelt upon them. Both are pretty similar to what the singers believe. The moon singers, the moon pale maiden, the moon mother, all incarnations of the many-faced God, sound pretty similar. Both the followers of the seven and the church of fairy wisdom consider stars holy. The pattern, a labyrinth leading to wisdom, Boas, the blind god, as well as the old ones of the Lengi, are deities we know very little about, but all are connected to labyrinths. The father of waters, the lady of the waves, Mother Oin, the drowned god, and the Merlin king are all water deities, nature gods that display different qualities depending on the culture of the people these religions originated from. Indra's of the Twilight is a deity worshipped in Lys, and is male by day and female by night. Again, a god with many faces, similar to the Seven as well, who has both male and female aspects. The dark and hungry gods of the patrimony of Hirkun sound very similar to the dark and hungry black god of Kohor, and so on. Most, if not all, religions that exist in this universe are connected to the world around them, life and death, underground mazes, earth, caves, roots, waters, fire and even stars and other celestial bodies. Multifaceted deities with human or even animal forms are also very prominent, including goat, horse, sheep, and even fish gods. It seems that all of them were created based on each culture's attempt to explain the nature and the world around them, but with magic being a part of this world. Is there really a reason for some of them to be real and some not? What is a useless religion? In the fandom, the word useless is used for the religion where the gods do not show their presence with magic visions, prophecies, or resurrections. The seven have the biggest useless label because it is the main religion, and compared to the rest of them, the seven do jack shit. But there is quite a big difference here. 
followers and priests of the seven never try to practice magic in the current timeline. So we can't know if they are indeed that fake. The Westerosi have dropped magic and human sacrifices, which we know the early Andals did practice. An old legend told in Pentos claimed that the Andals slew the swan maidens who lured travelers to their death into the Velvet Hill that lie to the east of the Free City. A hero whom the Pentosi singers called Hugo led the Andals at the time, and it is said that he slew the seven maidens not for their crimes, but instead as a sacrifice to his gods. Clad in mail and wielding iron swords and axes, the Andals swept across the island, slaughtering the hairy men in the name of the seven-faced gods and taking their women and children as slaves. As mentioned before, the sacrifice of the priest of Pentos is also most likely a remnant of Andal customs. And of course, the dream about Westeros Aegon had was added as a piece of information by George Martin in House of the Dragon, but the main idea, invading Westeros because of a prophetic dream, has been introduced before in the world book in the story of Hugo of the Hill, the Faith of the Seven, and the Andal invasion. The Sacred Book of the Faith, the Seven-Pointed Star, speaks of a golden land amidst towering mountains, when Hugo of the Hill received his vision of the bounty that would one day belong to the Andals. And the stories we get about the Andals during their invasion point them as very invested in visions and very fanatical, similarly fanatical to Mel and other lorists in the current timeline. In an era where magic was much more prominent, I doubt that so many people would be this faithful and would wage so many religious wars for a seemingly useless god when their neighbor could talk to animals. Additionally, old under stories talk of magic swords and people talking with gods like that of Galadon. Sir Galadon was a champion of such valor that the maiden herself lost her heart to him. She gave him an enchanted sword as token of her love. The just maid, it was called, no common sword could check her, nor any seal withstand her kiss. Sir Galadon bore the just maid proudly, but only thrice did he unskith her. He would not use the maid against a mortal man, for she was so potent as to make any fight unfair. The religion seems useless now, not because the gods are less real than the rest of the gods we have seen, but because their followers don't worship them as they did, and have dropped blood sacrifice and magic completely. I can bet that if Mel drops all sacrifices and blood magic, Rolor wouldn't do half of the things his followers claim. We haven't seen a god that gives without taking. So why would the Seven show their presence when the followers in the current timeline just pray and say, bro, please? It doesn't make sense. Magic always has a price, and more often than not, the price is blood or life. In the House of Black and White, they give their life to serve death, even sacrificing the potential life they might bring forth to serve the many-faced god. The wave saw ten fingers, then ten again, and yet again, then six. Her face remained as still as smooth water. She can't be six and thirty, Arya thought. She's a little girl. You're lying, she said. The wave shook her head and saw her once again. Ten and ten and ten and six. She said the words for six and thirty, and made Arya say them too. The next day she told the kindly man what the wave had claimed. She did not lie, the priest said, chuckling. The one you call Wave is a woman grown who has spent her life serving him of many faces. She gave him all she was, all she ever might have been, all the lives that were within her. The strongest green powers go to physically weaker individuals, more often than not. And we know that the gods were stronger when they were also practicing blood sacrifices to the trees. He took the wolves then back, stripped the slavers naked, and gave them to the slaves he found chained up in the dungeons. It said they hung their entrails in the branches of the heart tree as an offering to the gods. Mel is making sacrifices and Thoros was bringing Beric back, but never whole. Every time he was leaving behind part of himself. His fiery sword also, unlike the one of Sunny's, which is an illusion and is not even warm, required Beric's blood to be set ablaze. If the followers of the Seven and every other similarly useless religion don't do anything of this nature, why would they have powers? The way we as readers judge whether a god is real or not is by the existence of magic, mostly. But not everyone tries to practice magic to prove their gods exist. Melisandre, Thoros and Mokoro have powers, but so do Bloodraven and Bran, Jods and Howlan and the Ghost of Highheart. Pats and Aeron have prophetic dreams as well, in exchange for their sanity. Davos somehow survived for days after the Battle of Blackwater, and while on the spears of the Merlin King had visions of the Mother. The fire took my luck, as well as my sons. In his dreams the river was still aflame, and demons danced upon the waters with fiery whips in their hands. 
while men blacken and burn beneath the lash. Mother, have mercy, Davos prayed. Save me, gentle mother, save us all. My luck is gone, and my sons. Perhaps it was only wind blowing against the rock, or the sound of the sea on the shore. But for an instant, Davos Seaworth heard the answer. You call the fire, she whispered, her voice as faint as the sound of waves in a seashell, sad and soft. You burn us, burn us, burn us. How can we be sure whether this was just a fever dream or something more, considering that the fact that he is still alive is quite peculiar, and everyone and their mother seemingly have weird dreams that are not always random? Teora Toland and Sirin dreamed of dragons waking. Which good was that, because Teora is a follower of the Seven. An ugly little girl, and a sad fool, and Maester makes three. Now there is a tale to make men weep. Sit with me, child. This is early to come calling, scars past dawn. You should be snug in your bed. I had bad dreams, Sirin told him, about the dragons. They were coming to eat me. The child had been plagued by nightmares as far back as Maester Crescent could recall. We have talked of this before, he said gently. The dragons cannot come to life. It was then that pasty Pudgy Teora raised her eyes from the cream cakes on her plate. It is dragons. Dragons, said her mother. Teora, don't be mad. I am not, they're coming. How could you possibly know that? One of your little dreams? Teora gave a tiny nod, seen trembling. They were dancing, in my dreams, and everywhere the dragons danced, the people died. Seven save us, Lady Naimela gave an exasperated sigh. If you did not eat so many cream cakes, you would not have such dreams. Rich foods are not for girls your age, when your humors are so unbalanced. Maester Toman says, I hate Maester Toman, Teora said. Then she bolted from the table, leaving her lady mother to make apologies for her. Miri, as well as Quaith and other people like Mel, are religious and can practice magic, because it seems that whoever knows what to do can do magic. Someone can be taught to do various forms of magic. It is not 100% certain that faith and the existence of deities are the reasons for the existence of magic. My mother was a god's wife before me and taught me all the songs and spells most pleasing to the great shepherd, and how to make the sacred smokes and ointments from leaf and root and berry. When I was younger and more fair, I went in caravan to Asai by the shadow to learn from the mazes. Ships from any lands come to Asai, so I lingered long to study the healing ways of distant people. A moon singer of the Jogos Nai gifted me with her birthing songs. A woman of your own riding people taught me the magics of grass and corn and horse. And a maester from the sunset lands opened a body for me and showed me all the secrets that hide beneath the skin. Not everyone has magical blood, which is present in dragon riders and skin changers, but some types of magic are something everyone can learn, meaning that this higher power is probably the same one for everyone, just manifesting and channeled differently. Fantasy needs magic in it, but I try to control the magic very strictly. You can have too much magic in fantasy very easily, and then it overwhelms everything and you lose all sense of realism. And I try to keep the magic... magical, something mysterious and dark and dangerous, and something never completely understood. I don't want to go down the route of having magic schools and classes where if you say these six words, something will reliably happen. Magic doesn't work that way. Magic is playing with forces you don't completely understand, and perhaps with beings or deities you don't completely understand. It should have a sense of peril about it. In George Martin's universe, magic is deeply intertwined with natural concepts, such as animals, fire, plant, blood, light, darkness, water, the moon, stars, and other celestial bodies, etc. This connection reflects an animistic belief system where all elements of nature possesses a spiritual essence, something we saw being reflected in the religion of the old gods. Practitioners of magic tap into this essence to wield supernatural powers, feeding the trees, feeding the flames, giving sheep and babies to the cold gods, white calves to the aqua and the red bull, drinking bull's blood to become super strong, Everything seems to have its own spiritual print of sorts. Something that I always had on my mind is that knowingly or unknowingly, I don't know, a significant influence on Martin's magical framework is Plato's theory of forms. The theory suggests that the physical world is not as real or true as forms. Forms or ideas are the non-physical, timeless, absolute and unchangeable essences of all things, of which objects and matter in the physical world are merely imitations it looks like it to me. Because of the prevalence of magic in dreams, visions, and prophecies throughout the novels, where timelessness and eternity transcend the tangible world, you were looking through the eyes of the heart in your godhood. 
Time is different for a tree than for a man. Sun and soil and water, these are the things that we would understand, not days and years and centuries. For men, time is a river. We are trapped in its flow, hurtling from past to present, always in the same direction. The lives of trees are different. They root and grow and die in one place, and that river does not move them. The oak is the acorn, the acorn is the oak. And the weirwood, a thousand human years are a moment to a weirwood. And through such gates, you and I may gaze into the past. These new Larathi were worshippers of Boas, the blind god, rejecting all other deities. The followers of Boas ate no flesh, drank no wine, and walked barefoot through the world, clad only in hair shirts and hides. Their eunuchs priests wore eyeless hoods in honor of their god. Only in darkness, they believed, would their third eye open, allowing them to see the higher truths of creation that lay concealed behind the world's illusions. The worshippers of Boas believed that all life was sacred and eternal. The followers of Boas echo this the transcendence of time and space in certain magical practices, such as those involving weirwoods, death, dreams, and glass candles, also point to that. Melisandre's fear of sleep because of her belief that sleep brings one closer to death blurs the boundaries between reality and the spiritual realm. Descriptions of stars and the moon as eyes observing the earth, coupled with the connection between weirwoods and celestial bodies, create the idea of a cosmic consciousness fermenting the world. Πόσο φιλοσοφία σήμερα, Ρουφιάνα, δεν αντέχω. Dark underground places like the mazes in Lorath, in Lang, and I would even add Karth, which looks flat and only with one floor, but Danny was going up somehow, are described as serving as a passage for spiritual awakening, enabling individuals to access higher state of consciousness and perception through visions. And it makes sense because going deeper into the earth means they are closer to the core of planetos, And if everything has an essence, then Planetos sure has the biggest and the most powerful one. Everything on the planet wouldn't exist if it wasn't for it. It is the primary source and sustainer of all life on Earth. As the foundation, Planetos possesses the most potent spiritual energy that nourishes and empowers all beings. And Planetos being a planet and a celestial body suggests that all celestial bodies have their own essence. Religions based on the moon and the stars and fallen stars and comets revered as divine manifestations, capable of bestowing magical gifts and shaping the course of history, the bloodstone emperor worshipping a fallen star and the creation of legendary artifacts like the sword dawn from fallen stars exemplify the profound influence of celestial beings on the magical fabric of the world. <laughs> and the thing is, is this power at its core God? And similarly, the power of the moon, the stars, and all the planets exist because of God and deities. Dude, I don't know. Because what even is a God? Is it a being? Is it just a spirit or power? I'm going to quote Euron here, but considering this is a magical universe, the gods do not help very much, that's for sure. If the gods slash God is the creator and ruler of the universe and source of all moral authority, the supreme being, then they do not do a good job. If they are real, are they corporeal or not? Do they have a conscience or not? Personally, I believe in the nature of, the, of this planet, of this universe in general, being magical. I'm not keen on stuff being predetermined and people having their path written already, even with prophecies. Prophecies are murky, a sea of shadows and events. Knowing the final result doesn't determine the way to it. And everyone bears the consequences of their actions, either good or bad. Are these powers that are responsible for magic gods? Can we call them gods? I don't know. Do I like the idea of legit deities with conscience and everything? No. (laughs) But that's personal. You probably noticed I didn't touch on the long night at all. And this is because this is a whole other kind of ones in my opinion. And I would like to have a different video and not put this one here as well and have a seven hour video. (laughs) Also, it would be better to have the Lord video out first, which is going to be the next one. I hope you like this one. Tell me your theories and what you believe about gods and magic. If you enjoy this, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And see you in the next one. Bye!